thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, uh, we have some uh, great speakers that you'll hear about in a moment, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, Omicron, um, as well as what's happening with the, the Delta uh, virus. Um, John, I think we have a brief reflection. Um, uh, I, I like Helen Keller reflections. Uh, I think it's remarkable. And uh, the comment was, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. And I think um, if we think about the pandemic, that's, that's definitely the case. And it certainly fits in lots of other venues as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. McGinn who will introduce our speakers. Great, thank you so much, Gary. And thank you um, to our speakers. Um, happy holidays and happy new year to everybody uh, as we come into the holiday season. I think as Gary said, this is our final grand rounds of the year. And on that note, we are very pleased to have uh, Renuga Vivin Kandan, if I can say that correctly, I think I pulled it off, who's returning to speak with us. Uh, uh, Renuga is the Chief of Infectious Diseases at Creighton University. She did her internal medicine and pediatric residencies at the University of Nebraska and her infectious disease training uh, at Creighton University. Joining her is Dr. David Quinby, currently serves as Assistant Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Creighton, Medical Director of Infection Prevention at CHI Midwest. He did his training in Chicago at the University of Illinois. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, to hear from both of them, it's uh, we keep thinking we're going to get through this and get bored with the subject of uh, you know COVID, but it just keeps giving the gift that keeps giving. And I know in the Midwest, people are really working hard. So thank you for everybody, and uh, let's hear from our two panelists today. And I know they're sharing a room and wearing a mask. Very appropriate. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us today. So you know, I'm sure all of us have heard about Omicron now. I um, just want to give a quick background. So on November 24th, a new variant was detected. So WHO has a international database of all the sequencing across many countries where it goes in. And they keep an eye on if there's any variant that is rapidly spreading. And they started noticing in South Africa, they started having some cases. And then um, this variant was um, declared variant of concern. Right now in the United States, we have about 20 states with Omicron variants identified and in, um, around the world about 57 countries. Um, I still wanted to remind everybody, um, Delta is the predominant strain variant in the United States. And you know, if Omicron is to become a predominant strain, it's probably gonna take another eight weeks or more. So our main focus should still be on Delta, but it's good to start learning about this variant. We recently wanted to also share an experience in Omaha. We had a family um, that was identified and we were in, I think, New York Times, where um, there were, it was a travel related case, um, a patient who's vaccinated with mRNA vaccine returned from South Africa and five other members in his house uh, was infected and it was rapid infection within one to three days. Um, and thankfully so far, um, the family members and the patient uh, index patient are all mild cases. However, another interesting fact we'll touch base a little bit later is that the family members had a, um, COVID-19 infection in the recent past. So they got reinfected with Omicron variant. So, you know, we wanna look at doubling time for um, the cases. So this is from um, Gutten province in South Africa. So if you guys can see the first wave, second wave, third wave and fourth wave, and the fourth wave was where the arrow is pointing. So it's rapidly um, increasing the number of cases. And another interesting thing to look at too, the doubling time for Omicron is about one to two days, whereas Delta is one to five days. So it's spreading much faster. Um, you know, I get asked a lot about, is it how severe are the infections? We still don't know, we are learning a lot. But we do know the infection, however, is spreading rapidly. So here's from the same province where they had the outbreaks. If you guys look at the first seven day average, um, rapidly the cases are increasing with this variant, the red uh, curve. And if you look at the other three variants, the beta, the first wave, the delta, 
it was much slower when it started. Weekly sh uh, shares of test positivity is also vertically rapidly increasing. Thankfully, when you guys look at the hospitalization in this province, it's still pretty much close to the first wave and not as significant as the Delta wave. However, I was listening to some of the health experts in South Africa. So every time they have a um, COVID-19 wave, but they're in their population, it starts off in the young individuals, kids and young adults. So I don't know how to extrapolate that into our population. I think it's a little different, but there it's always starts with the young individuals, then spreads to the older adults. So we just have to be a little bit careful um, about this data, but it's still reassuring the hospitalization is still low. And overall in South Africa, if you can see, um, cases are vertically rapidly increasing at this time, but thankfully the death rates are still low. Um, so more to come when it comes to severity and death and hospitalization, um, but um, small like, our Omaha experience, thankfully, that six um, patients are still having mild infection and staying at home. So that's really reassuring. Um, but as the weeks go, we'll learn more and more about this variant. One thing that comes up a lot is uh, why do we care that there's a different name on this variant? Uh, first thing, you need to make sure that testing is accurate and can pick it up. There are a lot of mutations with this one uh, for those graphically inclined. There's a list of the relevant ones there on the bottom of the screen. The two main tests that we do looking for anybody with active COVID infection is an antigen test or a PCR test. The antigen tests tend to be designed for more conserved parts of the virus proteins. And so far with testing, uh, Omicron seems to be picked up on antigen testing. However, antigen testing itself is not as sensitive as PCR. So it is very possible you're more likely to have a false negative with any sort of infection with an antigen test as opposed to a PCR. On the PCR test, it really depends what test you're using. They look for different parts of the um, viral surface. The test from Thermo Fisher, um, their PCR will have a dropout on their S target, but the other two targets will still fire. So it will be read as positive. And actually, if you get that pattern, that's a hint you might be dealing with this variant. Uh, one test seems to miss. Um, it's by, up there on the screen, the Tide Laboratories DTPM COVID RT-PCR. But apparently, according to the uh, FDA release on it, that's not a very commonly used test. So you basically need to know what tests that you're doing. To truly determine what particular variant you have, you basically have to sequence it out and they're we have a lot more ability to do that than say a year ago, but it's still not a point of care test to do that and it takes time. Okay, so a lot of the talk is the number of mutations that are there. There are a lot of them. There are over 30 of them, but not all mutations are equal. We care about mutations at certain points. Uh, one is on the receptor binding and there are a fair amount of mutations there. Mutations there are important because that's where your antibodies stick to, and that's where monoclonal antibodies stick to. And if that area changes too much, your antibodies might not stick and you might not have protection from infection. There's also the uh, furin cleavage site, which is involved with cell entry. There's some mutations there, uh, which suggests that there might be more efficient cell entry, but there's also some mutations there that in the Petri dish might make it less efficient. So it's kind of a, all of this is based on Petri dish stuff right now, not necessarily actual clinical data on severity, ability to infect or ability to spread. They did find a certain deletion that seems to be involved with immune evasion that we saw in some other variants and perhaps increased infectivity. Again, though, this is just based on some earlier ones and how it reacts in a cell culture. Okay. We have read a lot about Norway. Um, this is actually a decent example because it goes into transmissibility. There was a gathering um, around November 26 with over 120 people in a facility. There were other people in the facility too. This is based on various popular reports as 
there is no official statement as of the last that I looked from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health with true numbers, but reports of high vaccination coverage and only vaccinated employees attended. Of the people in the group, more than 70 positive cases have been identified so far. Not all were sequenced. I believe the last I read 17 were, and all, were, all of those were Omicron. But there were other people in the facility too, not part of the group, and of those, 60 odd have been positive so far. On a happy note, as of a few days ago, no hospital admissions or deaths among this well over 100 people infected, whether that is because of the age of the people there, the fact that they were all vaccinated, where we know to get milder illness with pretty much any variant thus far, um, or if it is truly a less virulent strain, not clear, we're going to have to see, honestly, unvaccinated people infected to know if it's less severe or not. We know if we want to keep people out of the hospital, we know certain things that help, and the one that helps a lot is monoclonal antibodies. These have changed along the way. And I will not, although I normally don't use trade names or anything, I'm not attempting to pronounce these. So I will refer to the company. Um, there have been changes along the way. Initially, BAM came out and then BAM was no longer used when alpha became predominant because it was not effective against that. However, when delta became predominant, BAM could be used again because BAM was effective against that. And so now it's part of a combination that can be used too. So do these monoclonals work against the variants, the Omicron variants? The question is, well, it's the Petri dish thing again, okay? We do not have actual large amounts of people with known Omicron variants to see if they're prevented from being hospitalized or not. Based on Petri dish, commonly used Regeneron, suggests it might not be as effective as you would hope. Uh, the company says they are looking into it, um, and some preliminary tests in the Petri dish suggest it might not be as effective. Uh, newer than that is Sofrobimab, I believe, um, from GSK Beer. That one in the Petri dish seems to work, okay? Uh, the BAM combo um, suggests, based on some lab stories and artificial intelligence modeling, to be highly ineffective. Uh, the company's statement is that we are researching it, okay? So some of the commonly used monoclonal antibodies might not be as effective as this. We've seen this before. Uh, initially, when BAM came out, you just have to target what antibody you're using. And that really depends on how prevalent things are in the population. For example, with Delta being very prominent right now, well over 99% of cases, you can use any of these listed monoclonals. If you reach a point where, say, half of the variants are Delta and half are Omicron, then if it proves out that like the Regeneron combination is not as effective as Omicron against Omicron, you might have to change which monoclonal antibody you're using. But for right now, with Delta predominant, any of them. Excellent. And Dr. Quimby, can you talk about the new um, yes. uh, MAB? They did have that new one, um, which is approved for primary prevention in the immunocompromised with the six month half-life, um, not for necessarily treating an acutely ill person, but for prevention. And in uh, cell culture lines, it seems to be effective against Omicron as well. And I think that is really exciting news because we could give a lot of our immunocompromised patients on who on chemotherapy, other type of monoclonals, even not HIV patients with low CD4 counts. So I'm, I'm glad that we have that tool coming up. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a very complicated picture uh, from the CDC. They have tested various viruses with single mutations and see how well the antibodies work, the monoclonal antibodies work. The take home from this is big numbers bad, okay? Big numbers equal less effective. And that's why you see like with the BAM um, intensive MAB combination, I mean, you have one thing that's greater than a thousand in there, less likely to be effective. And in the Sotrova MAB, there's not that many uh, things that were found that interact and they are relatively low. So that is likely to be effective. One thing that has been raised a lot and various discussions on are prior infections. 
because prior infections do give some elements of immunity or resistance to severe infection. So does prior infection prevent you from getting Omicron infections? There's very little true data on this yet. However, looking at population in the in South Africa area retrospectively, they did find that with beta and delta, there was some elements of less likely to get a beta or delta infection if you had a prior infection. However, when they're looking at this one now, compared to your risk with beta or delta, it is higher. So that would be as if you did not have much protection from having a prior infection. Keep in mind here, I mean, all of this stuff dealing with anything because it's less than a few weeks old, has the normal caveats of early data, hasn't been verified, hasn't had other people look at it. And there could be various other reasons. For example, if you got an original ancestral strain infection, that was longer ago, so you're farther out now when Omicron's going around than when beta was going around. So it could just be a time factor. But it does seem that you might not have as much protection from prior infection with this strain than other ones based on very early, not yet reviewed data. And you know, when I was reading about this as well, um, they discussed in South Africa, less than 36% of the population is vaccinated, but they had much higher of the population actually had the infection. So by kind of also thinking about those two, it points as well. Um, there is some concern, like Dr. Quimby is saying, that it might have some uh, immune evasion mm -hmm. and get, um, you know, prior infection is not gonna protect current infection with Omicron. And that would not be entirely unexpected with the mutations it has in some of the binding targets for neutralizing antibody. The target is just changed so it's not there. So the antibodies right. that you made might not be as good. Exactly. Um, there are some really good news. Um, so um, lots of questions being asked about, does our current vaccines, are they effective against the new variant? So um, all our current vaccine makers are doing studies, but early study from Pfizer um, shows exciting data that there's robust uh, protection maybe uh, achieved by the third dose. So um, the, for the older strains, you needed the first two dose to have good antibody response, but for Omicron with booster, you're able to get 25 fold higher antibody production. So I think definitely our mRNA vaccines are effective, but also making sure that we get our boosters are gonna be really important. Um, and then there are some new treatments that are on the way as well. So oral antivirals like Tamiflu that we use for influenza. So Merck has a, a drug that was last week FDA gave EUA 13 to 10 approval for Malnupivir. And Pfizer has an oral um, antiviral called Paxlovid. So these two drugs, um, so I'm assuming Malnupivir will be available um, through EUA in the next couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> they have shown that they can reduce hospitalization and death by 50%, but also, um, and then for the Pfizer drug by 89% hospitalization in term um, data, but we have not seen the trial data for Pfizer data. So this is just company data, um, initial data that they're providing. Personally, um, I think it might have some effectiveness, but um, I do not think, um, I heard with Malnupivir, they have done more analysis on the data, and now it's showing it might be 30% effective versus 50%. So any tool is better, um, but I'm not as excited as I was with uh, monoclonals, but this is also going to be a tool. It's a five-day regimen for both antivirals. Um, and a twice a day regimen, so twice a day, five days for treatment for both of these oral antivirals. Anything to add? Keeping in mind there, when they say 50%, that sounds very good. Mm -hmm. uh, monoclonal antibodies, when they were tested, were, depending on what study you're looking at, 70, 78% or, or higher in some cases. So anything that decreases your risk of hospitalization is good. It is much easier to administer a pill than an infusion or an intramuscular dose of uh, monoclonal antibodies. 
so anything would be useful. They have found on the limited data available, once you are already sick enough to be in the hospital, uh, these antivirals might have less of an, at least the molnupiravir might have less of an effect, but again, need actually more information and not uh, practicing via press release. And that was our update. Any questions, we're happy to answer. Go ahead, Gary, why don't you start? I'll follow. No, I just, I have one, uh, and it, and it um, really is about the oral antivirals and also the sotrovimumab. And uh, the sotrovimumab appears to have more activity with Omicron, but what is the ETA, like is sotro, can you go into the UCSF and say, I want sotrovimumab, is it available? Um, and the same, what's the ETA on the oral antivirals? Yeah, so the monoclonals, um, all the three different monoclonals, they're um, given through the federal government to each yes. of the states. So we have all have an allocation. So right now we just take whatever we get. So you know, yes. you know, we interchange each of the monoclonal. Then we need a higher amount of that produced. So hopefully we'll have the supply for the demand. And that's where you need to keep in mind what is actually circulating because we are currently yeah. at 99 plus percent Delta. It does not right. matter which of those monoclonals yes. you get. That is exactly. so you reach a point where you're like 50% Delta and 50% uh, Omicron, and it pans out that the Regeneron combination is not as useful against Omicron, you would have to move over to the other one to try to effectively treat more people. And as far as the Molnupivir, we just heard for the state of Nebraska, we're going to get 400 doses. So the supply, mm -hmm. even if it's a somewhat effective, the supply seems to be really low. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we could ramp that up as well. I think that's the way we saw that at the beginning where they gave it out and then slowly it became more available. I think the, um, I mean, both the oral agents, I mean, first of all, they're just so much easier to give. So I think, you know, when you look at effectiveness, it's likely to be more broadly utilized or in some ways more effective just because more people can get it. Um, I always have to use my EBM math. The percent reduction is a relative risk, risk reduction. So when we say 90%, it's like a 7% versus a 2%, I think was the reduction because the absolute reduction was 5%. So people you know, love to use their relative risk reduction. I can't help but talk EBM all the time. But, um, so, you know, very interesting. The one thing I was going to ask you about, I think the testing, I want to come back to the testing because I think that creates some confusion with folks. The question, there's two questions. One is, can it just tell you if you have COVID, whether it's antigen or PCR? And the second question, can it distinguish between, you know, Omicron, Delta, et cetera? So I just want to make sure we're saying this the right thing, that the tests we currently use, mm -hmm. PCR and antigen, are unaffected by the fact that this is Omicron, its ability to say whether you have mm -hmm. COVID. Right. right. It is a test for COVID infection, and your standard testing will not let you know which variant you have. Right. right. So and but it has only... not our ability to detect COVID. That's why I want to make sure people hear that. Yes. And we've never really spent you know, tested you for Delta versus this. So I, I just want to be clear, but there was some discussion that our central lab, there might be some issues on PCR, but I, so I just want to, is that true or David, or are you? Uh, from what we hear, um, we talked to a micro director, lab director, mm -hmm. and he said we are yeah. able to detect it. The ones that we're doing here do not have a problem. Okay. Uh, the FDA gave a release um, not too long ago like when I say not too long ago, I mean like two, three days about various PCR tests um, and if they would detect this variant or not. And one of them would give you a false negative test. So if you were infected with the Omicron variant and you had that PCR test, it would say you do not have COVID. So we need to be clear because folks may not be using the same PCR test uh, on common spirit. So in the different markets, so maybe on the attachment for this talk, we'll, we'll, we'll send that out. I know yeah, that, that one test was outlined there on the slide and there was a, I can come up with the FDA link. Yeah, and it also had the locations where that test is utilized as well. So okay. it's a really it nice- It wasn't that it was a hundred percent. I mean, it was just a little less accurate. It wasn't like a 
you know, missing all of them. My understanding and, of the alternatives. Yeah. I think and it also, um, just your other question about detecting Omicron, I think that just goes back to doing sequencing and you, right. most of the state that goes through the DHHS and, you know, the public health labs. We talked just before going live could, could you just share a little bit, and, and particularly for us in the, uh, on the West Coast where our hospitals are less impacted, could you talk a little bit about what hospital care is like in Omaha? And I realize it's Delta and not Omicron, but yeah. just where are you guys? And uh, are you to the point of canceling elective surgeries or ICUs full or could, could you just, I just think that's helpful for people to get some reality in terms of what yeah. it's like across the Midwest. I looked at this data two days ago. So we have hundred, sorry, thousand fully staffed beds and they are always full. And we have about um, five beds that open up and they and there's 30 patients waiting to get into those five beds. Mm -hmm. um, we have so many patients on waiting list from our rural communities. Um, ER patients are in, some are in the hallway, some are in parking lot waiting to be seen. Um, so our infection rate is really high. Our neighboring university, um, they have, uh, as of December 13th, they're canceling elective surgeries again. Mm -hmm. um, we have not done that at CHI Health, but um, our overall COVID-19 hospitalization is rapidly rising. And another really, really important thing we're seeing with Delta Surge is young people are getting really severe infection, 25, 30, 35, 40. And a lot of young people are passing away that do not have health conditions, any comorbidities. It's affecting um, non-COVID patients as well. Uh, we're mainly based at our tertiary hospital here. And so we routinely, normally would take transfers from other hospitals. Right. We can't. Um, so daily, I'm fielding phone calls from docs at other facilities uh, wanting infectious diseases help for non-COVID things because there's other things out there too and they can't move their patients to the higher level of care. Um, so they're dealing with it at the uh, community the, access sites. The side effect of having all of this happening. Mm -hmm. I just want to say one thing and this is more of a maybe an academic conversation which you know I'm prone to do but when we say that more young people are getting sick, I, I, it's, you know, I think it doesn't mean that things have changed and that COVID is impacting young people more than they did in the past. I, I'm, it's sort of a question or a statement here. More young people are infected because of the spread of the virus so that the, the percent is the same, but the number is bigger of younger people in the hospital. I, you, we have, I, I, you know, we have to be careful what we say because you're at the, you're at yeah. the tertiary. You're seeing- We, we also insane. have, Yes, part of that is changed in its its ability to create severity in young people, or just that more young people are affected, so there are more people, young people with severe infections. And what is the epidemiology on that? Because that's yeah. a very different question. So um, I'll, let me say one thing first. So we looked at this data in Nebraska. Um, so we are seeing more severe disease in younger individual now compared to before. Um, it's ten. 10 times the same amount of 30-year-old um, and 80-year-old to get admitted, it's likelihood of getting admitted in the hospital. We just looked at the data. Um, personally, I have taken care of um, patients um, all ages, but personally, I have not seen the severity as I'm seeing currently. Um, what would you say? I would say we might have selected um, protection for the older folk because older folk are statistically a lot more likely to be fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so we know that you're more likely to get severe disease if you're not vaccinated. So if the older folk are vaccinated and becoming ill, they're less likely to have severe disease. So they're less likely to be in the hospital. The younger folk tend to be less likely to be vaccinated. So we're, they're getting and more likely to get the severe disease when there's a lot of stuff running around the community. Hey, there's some more questions here, Gary. Um, yeah, so there's, can I read that there's, off or you want to take yeah. it? Well, no, let's, um, I think uh, there's two questions in the Q&A. First one is from Mark Klein and, and it's, Mark admits it's, it's, it's asked for speculation, but, but uh, certainly it's worth talking about. Um, to what degree, if at all, might we be able to speculate that one, 
Omicron will become the dominant var variant. Two, it's more infectious and less severe. And three, and I think you talked about being infectious, um, yes. therefore its spread could have its own virtues and traject trajectory of the pandemic could be relatively better. So that's the most hopeful question I've heard in a while. Yes. And Very good I'm not going to an answer and I'm Thank just going to believe it. Okay. Uh, okay. We know that there have been very super spreader events with every um, with every variant. Okay. So using one particular case and known spread doesn't necessarily let you see the whole picture. The Norway exposure thing would suggest that this is very highly transmissible. And even locally in our uh, Nebraska case, one right. patient infecting every <laughs> single household member would suggest it's highly transmissible. So that would put its transmissibility on the par of Delta or more. Mm -hmm. If it's more transmissible and there's enough cases to found a population, eventually it would outcompete Delta, but that would take a fair amount of time to get there unless it's introduced a lot at the initial stage. Um, as to severity, the problem is most of the cases we've seen so far are in younger folk or vaccinated folk. Right. And it is not fair to really judge severity based on that crew. If you show me a bunch of 70, 80 year olds infected mm -hmm. with Omicron and aren't very sick, or a bunch of unvaccinated folk in the 50 plus crowd mm -hmm. who are not vaccinated or, or are vaccinated, whatever, yep. and get Omicron, you show me a lot of them who aren't very sick, then I mm -hmm. might become a believer. Otherwise, it's way too premature. And we like the story. We enjoy that story very much, Mark. Thank you. Yes. And, the, and there's uh, just a, a sense. Can you comment on the importance of vaccination and boosters, of course, in light of increasing Delta and new cases of Omicron? Yeah. So I think vaccination is going to be really important. Boosters are really important. Um, as you could see, um, Del um, Omicron seems to be having breakthrough infection, and um, especially with the Pfizer study, you definitely need to get boosters and also make sure we all vaccinated as well if we haven't received the primary series. Yeah. So the messaging has to be vaccine plus masking. Right, and kids. Um, um, and just one last question for me, why, why are we seeing this surge in Delta now? And I don't know if there's an answer, but why now? It seems like they're we're gonna, like, they're gonna get the hey, Nobel Prize if they answer that one. Yeah, yeah. Maybe well, I'm, I'm to, you. You know, right? and that's <laughs> like a Nobel question, right? We're gonna get. I think everybody is getting together, relaxed and yeah. wearing masks. Um, you know, for example, in Nebraska, a population of vaccinated individual is still like less than 60%. Mm. So you still have the pandemic in the other 40%. So um, it, it all depends, you know, state by state. Um, you know, I love what New York is doing, really vaccinating vaccine passports. But, you know, I think the pandemic is spreading because of partly because of the unvaccinated individuals and also breakthrough infections, too. And you also time of year might play a large role of this. Mm -hmm. For example, we saw a very large uptick some months ago in Florida when it was very, very hot, okay? They're opposite from here. We're outside a lot when it's hot here in Nebraska because it's not Florida hot. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Florida, there's a difference, okay? Yes. So they were kind of maybe congregating indoors and now we're doing that more because it's getting mm -hmm. cooler. So part of that and people's behaviors could be playing a role too. Got it. All right, Gary, All right. I guess we should wrap up. Yes, that's great. All right, well, thank you for that timely conversation. Renuga is back again. So good to see you. Can we have you just show your face without your mask for two seconds? Let's see. Yes. Don't breathe. Just so yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I know you guys are on the front lines and in infectious disease. You, you've been going at this for over two, almost close to two years now. So, you know, thank you for everything and everybody watching as you're going through this. Thank you once again. Happy holidays. Happy new year. Gary, I'll give you the last word. No, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, Renuga reminded me that she was on our uh, very first call with Dr. Hotez. And so here we are, the right. last call of the year. And here's Renuga again. So thank you both thank very you. much. Really great. Thank you.